Today, um, I'm, I'm here to talk about food regulations and their uh, effects on international agreements. And arguably, actually, you could you could turn that round and say um, what uh, impacts international agreements have on our food regulations. So uh, the genesis of my talk might be a bit uh, both ways, but they, they certainly do uh, gel together. But, but also what we, we consider alongside that is, is wider political and social outcomes we want from a food system that always kind of sits in behind what we're doing. There we go. Uh, so, so quickly today I'll cover broadly um, why do we need food regulations at all. Um, I'll talk about the global environment that, that I'm familiar with and, and the changes in that. Specifically, a little bit about our market access arrangements and, and what uh, some of the drivers there may or may not be. Uh, coupled with that would be our international agreements. And then I'll finish with, OK, so what is the role of New Zealand's food safety standards in, in facilitating trade? Some of this is motherhood and up apple pie, but so why do we need food regulations? Um, or maybe it might be to keep people safe from uh, foodborne incidents. Uh, but a qualifier from uh, a trade perspective is, in a way, that facilitates trade. And of course we want um, consumers to have trust and confidence in our food, and foreign governments to have trust and confidence that our food meets their requirements. And I'll go on a little bit about requirements later because um, they are all under the auspices of food safety, but there's quite a difference in what a requirement in, in uh, different countries will be about what they consider safe or not safe or how we should assure that. And uh, really in my experience, uh, the greater the trust and confidence there is, the easier it is to trade. And I'm just not talking about foreign governments, I'm talking about consumers, the whole kind of ambit. If, if, um, if people have that trust and confidence, whether they're consumers or a foreign government, it's just going to be easier to trade in that product. Simple. Maybe I should leave now. <laughs> no, not quite so simple. Um, the, the global environment. Now, I've, I've been involved with the APEC Food Safety Cooperation Forum, so I have stolen uh, some of our, uh, our work, but uh, MPI and a range of other economies in APEC have been working on this. But this is kind of out of a, a document I'll refer to a little bit, but this kind of sets the, the global environment um, about uh, um, how countries or organisations uh, feel or see uh, foodborne uh, problems, and clearly it's a, a big problem. And these are the latest data we could get uh, for this was um, in, in 2010 from the WHO, but the numbers I think right. may be pretty much the same now or even more. Uh, lots of cases of foodborne illnesses, uh, a fair number of deaths, and a huge amount of losses um, in, in productivity and people's performance. So uh, human costs, which couples and forms into economic costs, uh, with those figures, uh, will speak for themselves. So coming, coming back home, so uh, why, why then is trade so important to New Zealand primary industries? And... Um, um, Clearly, our primary industries and in, in the food part of that is vital to the New Zealand economy. Um, a large percentage of our um, GDP, our gross domestic product, um, a fair chunk of our employment, and um, probably arguably too, still too high uh, of a percentage of our um, merchandise exports all, all come from our primary sectors. Slight quali qualifier there that would include uh, a bit of forestry as well that might up that, that uh, figure, but uh, certainly um, figures will speak for themselves. From, from a New Zealand point of view, and what makes New Zealand um, uh, quite unique, and I want to focus a little bit on, on this part of the chart here, is this, this is a percentage of our domestic production 
of these uh, commodities that is exported. So the, the, just basically the message there is actually most of our consumers of these uh, sit offshore and, and a very high amount of our, our consumers um, um, are not in New Zealand. Uh, they, they, they're somewhere else. So then uh, we can then focus in on, so what are the conditions of trade? Um, and so where we sit, that the food must be safe. But, but from, from a market access or trade negotiation point of view, that, that's your entry level. It's not safe you to even go to the table. It's just not going to go anywhere near uh, getting in, into, into the market. And then it's uh, over and above that, it's got to meet the importing country requirements. So that could be just the simple domestic food laws, just as anyone exporting to New Zealand has to meet Food Act requirements. Um, so too uh, do we in other countries. And then coupled with that is whatever's placed at the border to provide the assurance that it meets uh, the importing country requirements. And again, how well we achieve that and have that will determine the ease of access New Zealand has for our for our products. <clears throat> so what will give a foreign government um, confidence in, in New Zealand's food and New Zealand's food product? And um, uh, a lot of people would answer to me if I asked them that question directly is will it be New Zealand's reputation for safe food, that consumers seek out New Zealand products, so on and so forth. I'd, I'd respond to that by saying, um, if that was the case, why is it then that almost all of our trading partners add a little something uh, to the New Zealand system that we would say assures safe food? So there's a little bit more than just being, being safe there. We have a range of uh, requirements from um, not only um, uh, uh, countries that don't have good systems, but arguably countries that should know better, that impose a whole lot of um, uh, additional requirements on, on New Zealand. So why is, why is that the case? And I'd answer that reputation will get us to the table. Um, and then we're alongside maybe 50 other countries that produce safe food. So you'd say all of North America, all of Europe, most of South America, and, and, um, and, and many uh, uh, developing and developed Asian countries would produce as safe a food as New Zealand or, or thereabouts. So um, getting to the doors of one thing, uh, the ability to meet those importing country requirements better than our competitors is what can give us that extra edge um, in, in the market or any country. So what do then we rely on for that? Uh, uh, obviously our robust regulatory and assurance systems, but they have to consistently deliver that safe product and the product that meets importing country needs and that we are a credible partner. So it's a package uh, all together. And from New Zealand's position, our, um, an advantage for us in the world is that that is supported by uh, technical competency and MPI and our industry and, and, and other partners, uh, that we do lead a lot of systems and, and standards innovation. Uh, we have trusted relationships with many of our uh, uh, trading partners and um, we shouldn't ever lose sight that, uh, that New Zealand is considered to be one of the least um, corrupt type countries in the world and in fact we, we do do what we say we do and there's a great deal of certainty that we will uh, follow those tracks. So that coupled together supports the trust and, and confidence uh, that we need to be a, a credible trading partner. So where do we sit in the world trade system? Um, we're, we're an open economy, so we don't kind of restrict the exports or, or, or imports. Uh, we're a very small market 
and a long way uh, from our international trading partners. So actually we have very, very little reciprocal trade value to our partners. So if we went to most of our partners and said, here you can have 5 million or thereabouts consumers, give us your 70 million, the answer will be, no, thank you. So we need to think of um, uh, some other ways of, of getting there. And, and one of the unique uh, parts, I think, is that we must remember that because, in, as we described before, we're heavily reliant on the primary industries uh, for uh, our export trade, and therefore we do need to have a, a balance between our food safety and, I put, and biosecurity uh, rules on the one hand um, and then open trade on the other. And for New Zealand, um, uh, being, uh, because of those conditions on, on the slide there, that is possibly places us in a very unique position in the world. We export so much of our primary products. Most of our production is geared for export markets. Our competitors, quite often it's domestic surpluses or or just a small part of their um, of their economy. So New Zealand is in quite a unique trading position when it comes to uh, primary products. Uh, the, these slides, and, and you'll be, I don't intend to go reading them all, but this, this gives you a taste from uh, our market access global strategy yet to be published, so you get a sneak preview here, of um, some of the regulatory and legal challenges uh, from food systems that impact on, on our market access. And I think uh, those people familiar with global trading environments uh, um, would, would probably understand and see these things. If, if anything, they're getting worse as we move on, but they, they're some of the challenges that we would, would face. So um, uh, many regulations uh, popping up on food and, and um, other uh, phyto and sanitary arrangements. Uh, plenty of attempts now by regulators to come into our production systems and try and tell us what to do uh, on, on how we should uh, process things and improve premises and things like that. Uh, we still face a lot of inflexibility in importing country laws. They just have a law that might be 20 years old and they stand there and enforce it regardless of, of whether we are a risk or not. And um, um, uh, still uh, prescriptive laws versus outcome based like we have in, in, in New Zealand. And, and also, a, a lot of the laws in our um, um, uh, importing countries actually don't reference the international standards and trading rules, uh, so they're unable to comply with them from their own law, whereas in New Zealand we do, and I'll go on to it a little bit later, make quite an attempt to um, uh, introduce international best practice into our domestic environment. Um, just going through the list is, is issues around testing and zero uh, tolerances uh, and that is a, a big problem with new testing technologies that go down to parts per billion and they find something that shouldn't be there, absolutely no risk but um, uh, that's what's happening. Uh, more and more costs of border protection um, and, and as I said those detection technologies, uh, inefficiencies, uh, across the board and what we're dealing with and, and also still a reliance on endpoint testing. Uh, you're sure it's safe by giving it a test at the end of the production process and if it kind of passes that you can eat it. It doesn't gel quite well with, uh, with the New Zealand system. So what are we doing about that and how do we respond at a trade policy level? Uh, I don't think there's anyone from MFAT here to challenge. Uh, but this comes out of their statement of, of corporate intent, so uh, they can't challenge, it's written. But clearly uh, New Zealand subscribes to uh, international rules-based uh, systems, not only in, in food or biosecurity, but across the board. And I think the last line there is the one that we should focus on. Rules rather than simply power which I described before we don't actually have in a market, um, provides small and internationally connected countries like New Zealand with protection from that great big list I said in the last two slides.
and, and how we go about uh, doing that um, is that successive New Zealand governments have, have made it a priority for New Zealand to act as a principal <laughs> trader within a rules-based <laughs> system. And um, from the food safety perspective, uh, those rules basically sit in the WTO sanitary and phytosanitary agreement. And that agreement is the cornerstone of our market access negotiating position, our ability to influence the rules themselves, and to protect and advance New Zealand's interests. <coughs> and and the, the last line there is just simply saying that we do have a major interest, uh, given our position, in proposing, influencing, adopting and promoting those agreed international standards. And our experience uh, has shown that uh, the more a trading partner standards look and feel the same as New Zealand, the easier it is for our negotiation. And I've got a bit of an example of the Rolls Royce of that. I see Glenn Nielsen thing over there, which I'll just have a quick mention of our relationship with Australia as, as, as a demonstration of that. So New Zealand does support harmonised food standards, but those need to be harmonised and benchmarked against agreed international standards. And, uh, but we do accept that assuring compliance against those standards is, uh, even if they are the same, can be quite problematic for the things I'd mentioned before around testing or border controls and, and things like that. But um, codex processes are designed to address those issues, but uh, it'd be fair to say that some of those processes can take some time and they're slow to respond to new threats and issues. Have I finished? No, I haven't. <laughs> um, quick demonstration. So MPI's legislative systems, our risk management frameworks and our food standards are all based on international uh, guidance and, and, and best practice. And um, New Zealand Food Safety, along with other MPI businesses, uh, makes a significant investment in the development, promoting and use of international standards to advance our, our sector's interests. And I'll just give a very brief example of a, of a piece of work that we have been working on internationally, and I referred to this as that uh, a three-year project was to produce a guideline for APEC members and anyone else that wants to grab this off a, a website and how you should go about modernising a food safety framework that supports trade. And uh, MPI has promoted the development of this guide and we will move on to promote the implementation of that bilaterally with, with these member countries. <laughs> and I only go through all of this, but, but basically the guide takes you through a range of steps that rather... Um, fortuitously, you know, by design, actually follow uh, uh, international guidelines of how you might set up a food safety system. And, and if you look at that, this basically would mirror how we go about, how we've gone about and how we'll go about uh, implementing our food safety system. And i just highlight the two top points uh, from this international guidance document, which I think is quite important. The first principle is yeah, you've got to protect consumers. If you take your eye off that, then obviously you're in a bit of trouble. And then if you have any conflict, then the consumers will always win. So very clearly the focus has to be on consumers. And then we go on to trade. It hurts me to say this being a trade person. But uh, the second principle is that you do it in a way that is least trade restrictive. So protect consumers. Keep an eye on your ability to trade, and they throw in, but still protect consumers while you're trading. So uh, clear, clear guidelines uh, moving forward on that. So there's there's no possibility of a trade-off on trade and consumer protection, and, and that's not what was um, wanted. Uh, interestingly enough, New Zealand co-sponsored this. It was an Australian Fizans, um <laughs> Uh, and, and government initiative, plug that, seems to sort of people there. But, but China, Vietnam, Chile, Peru and US were quite active in the working group, but all um, APEC member economies um, have subscribed up uh, 
uh, to those guidelines and we, working bilaterally, will try and sell that. Um, I'll just use a Rolls-Royce uh, example, in my view, of, of what is a really, really good bilateral trading agreement. So under our close economic relations with Australia, um, through uh, multiple uh, tools, we have a single set of labelling and compositional standards between Australia and New Zealand markets. And we also have mutual recognition of our, of our risk management systems. So the outcome of that is all food produced in New Zealand can be sold in Australia without further control. And I put in brackets, biosecurity accepted both ways. So this is food safety requirements. And what that has meant to um, the participants in this is uh, obviously commercial certainty. You're not going to get stopped at the border. Uh, reduced risks and costs and variability for exporters and improved export participation, um, especially for small and medium-sized businesses under that regime. So remove all those barriers, as we were saying, is our aim, and bang, uh, you have your um, uh, uh, market access pretty much um, assured moving through. The quid pro pro is we have to ensure that our system remains fit for purpose. We don't end up um, poisoning people offshore. Even Australia. <laughs> I'll just uh, uh, finally, so, so coming back to the theme, so how do we design and implement food standards um, uh, has a profound impact on trade and our ability to comply or influence uh, international agreements. Here's another snippet from our market access uh, global strategy. And there's some of the, the views that we're saying that we need to be cognizant of. So we need to ensure our domestic and export standards reflect best international practice, uh, that New Zealand standard setters are aware of this global environment around food standards, and, and, and including private standard initiatives, um, and also to maximise the ability to defend New Zealand's food standards as meeting the outcomes required by international markets and or corporate customers. So the next line here is really quite important because the aim from a business perspective is to minimise the need for industry to substantially change <coughs> their practices depending on the market they're exporting to because that is costly, it, it's um, certainly market restrictive. Uh, but it's not only governments that force businesses to do that, but it's the private standards uh, and so on and so forth. So it then comes back to, you know, our, our first priority is to ensure that our world-class food safety systems remains robust in responding to those future challenges. Thank you. I don't normally blush, but I think I am now. Thank you, Paul. <laughs> yeah, the expert title, thank you, and, and thanks for the pressure. I appreciate that very much. I hope you can cope with my Australian accent. No one's flinching yet? Excellent. So I won't start with an apology, but I will start with perhaps an explanation. Um, this is the title of the presentation, and the reason for that is when people first started speaking to me about coming here today, we were banding about topics, ideas, and the gist of what I might talk about. And this came up very quickly, communicating difficult science to lay people. And I can't help it, as a science communication guy and as an academic, I thought, I'm going to take that and I'm going to pull it apart for a moment. So not to pick on the people who suggested it, because it's a very reasonable starting position, but it's something that's worth discussing. So starting to think about this from my perspective. For starters, this notion of difficult science. So. What is difficult science? And we talked about novel foods, and I'll confess immediately, novel foods is not my expertise. Talking about things like it is, but novel foods in particular is not. So when I think about novel foods, one of the first things I consider is almost definitely not novel problems. The issues of communication, etc., with them will be probably not even remotely unique, quite frankly, in many situations. And more importantly, though, the science is probably not the difficult bit. So novel foods isn't a difficult science, but the issues surrounding it may well be. Second, as Paul flagged, communicating science 
uh, difficult science to lay people, I of course have to bounce up and down about the word to, the implication of one-way communication, we bring the wisdom from the mountain and shall bestow it upon you, is something that we don't strongly encourage in my realm. And I don't think I would encourage it anywhere unless your goal is to dominate and be the boss or not be listened to. It's not a good option. It's always ironic when I lecture on this sort of stuff. Don't just stand there and tell people what to do. And I stand up there and tell people this. So why would you listen to me? Paul's told you I'm an expert. <laughs> Ignoring that. So I have a background in psychology and um, also in medical anthropology. That's what kind of got me fascinated about how people think, comparing cultures, comparing belief systems, etc. But that was all getting a bit too strange for me. So it all munched together into a PhD in science communication. So that's what I did two and a half thousand years ago. Since then, I've been designing science communication courses, and I've done some of the some of the first in the world, not the absolute first, but we're down close. I've done a lot of uh, national polls in Australia, um, often with comparisons to other countries, beliefs and attitudes towards science amongst non-science folk, um, attitudes towards the professions of science compared to others and so forth. I'm very interested in risk and persuasion because it's fascinating. <laughs> For a person who likes how humans work, risk and persuasion is a wonderful place to play. And as Paul flagged as well, I'm moving more into this idea like, I don't like the phrase public intellectualism because it sounds, I'm going to use an Australian and a New Zealandism, very wanky. <laughs> that said, um, what lies behind it is actually quite useful because it means getting out beyond the hallowed walls of academia, etc., and using what we've learned to be more useful and interesting, which is why I do a lot of public communication in my, uh, in my job. Blog posts, opinion pieces, uh, Podcast, obviously that thing on the bottom uh, right to you is the best podcast that's related to science in the world. I can hardly recommend it because I'm half of the team. Um, but also <laughs> public presentations in um, major organisations, minor organisations, advice to NGOs, governments, blah, 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 blah. That's the expert bit, I think, Paul, is that right? Yeah, okay. So from that perspective, what's science communication? So first up, I just want to briefly mention it from my point of view. So I've been around this discipline not quite as long as it's existed, but quite close, because um, it's very young, as am I, obviously. And what, what strikes me when I look at science communication is it really meanders around these three realms. It's not just scientists going out to the public, whoever they may be, and putting science in their brains. It's often that, but it's also us listening to publics. Um, there's science to policy makers. While they are publics, they're also a very unique kind. And more than anything else, quite often in my world, it's scientist to scientist. Different kinds of scientists, when they talk to each other, are a fascinating thing to watch from an academic point of view and also just a straight interest in humanity. And I, I say what we do is English to English translation because I'm speaking from an Australian context. The point being, we take some kind of language that everyone understands but not quite and turn it into a different kind of the same language that everyone hopefully will understand. And all of this has to be done in context and you're going to get sick of context by the time I finish. <laughs> I call it the C word at home, and it's the C word everywhere I go. Context is the big one here. So when I deal with people, when I talk to people, especially if I'm sort of offering advice or offering um, consultancies, the first thing I'll do, this is not revelatory, I'll ask people what their goals are. This is from the science communication point of view. What are your goals? And to summarise just about everyone's response to that, particularly in climate science lately, but this is basically... What I hear, it's important that people understand this science, whatever this science may be. That, they say, is their goal. And that makes me scratch my head and I say, well, that's, that's fine. So tell me why. I'm curious to know why you think that is your goal. I get told this. Again, paraphrasing and summarising over many people, many sciences, etc. So they'll see there's a problem. If they understand the science, they'll see there's a problem. And almost potentially, more importantly, they will then do something about it. They will act in a way that's cognizant or uh, concurrent with the science and do something about it. I understand why people would think that. The reality is that's really the case. And what this reflects is something we uh, talk about a lot in my realm, the deficit model. I don't know, is this a phrase familiar to people? Excellent, I can tell you whatever I want then. This is, <laughs> this is a, an image of the deficit model, I think, encapsulated. The public are a giant empty-headed bucket waiting to be filled. The science comes along with delicious science facts, pours it into their heads. The public are made better. Things will improve. <laughs> I know, it's simple. I can stop as well right here. Now, there are some issues with that. It starts with the idea that education equals all these things. 
If you are educated, you will be motivated, you will be inspired, you will change your attitudes, you will change your behaviours, you will accept the science. Sometimes yes, sometimes no, never so straightforward. This privileges science information above all other kinds of knowledge, which, I mean, we all know this, this is already problematic, potentially, depending on what you're trying to do. Also, expertise in this sense is formal scientific qualification. People might not say this out loud, but this is really the implication of the application of this sort of thinking. It relies on many things, but one of the main ones is the idea that people behave rationally, or at least that people will be motivated to behave rationally. The truth is, um, people aren't that rational. Or rather, their rationales aren't that apparent, and often not made explicit. So the rationality of the thinking is often very clear. What it's based upon is a whole other story, and that's something we have to delve into quite a bit. So, there's that C word again. Context matters, and it matters a lot. And in fact, it often matters more than the science matters. Which might not make science people comfortable, but that's okay. It's not my job to make you comfortable, it's my job to try and help. Now, I've had this launched at me too when I say this. That's just a bunch of hippie crap. You care about people's feelings, the science isn't more important, I don't like that. I'll give you an example. So, in the past, as I say, earlier this century, I love being able to say that, earlier this century, I used to do a lot of work with UNESCO in the Pacific. Their main office is in Samoa, in Apia. So I moved in and out of there a few times up, up until a few years ago. And there are many stories from this that relate to the notion of context. But one of my favourites was talking to a nutritionist who was brought in by the UN to talk to people in Samoa about obesity, heart disease, diabetes, etc. related to diet. And she was at the opening of a school, and like many countries in the world, when there's a major event, lots of food. Lots and lots of food. The tables were groaning with cans of Spam. We all know what Spam is, yeah? And the, the, some of the cans are sold in five kilo lots. Lots and lots of Spam. Spam is very popular, at least it was last time I was in Samoa. And she turned to some of the people and said, what are you doing? This, this stuff is it's poison. This is a terrible thing to eat. This is part of the reason that you have obesity, diabetes, etc., etc." And she was told very quickly, what, you want us to give up our traditional foods? And this stunned her because it's not what she expected to hear. But this is the point, you know, the context for them, the people she was speaking to in particular, was this had taken on the status of something quite traditional, something that they valued, the people she was speaking to. I didn't expect that even, I thought it's a great story about context. So the risk for them was to stop eating traditional food. Anyone else know that? I didn't know that. So why don't you just use straightforward stats? Let's take the culture stuff out. It's easy to talk about cross-cultural experiences and how they can go wrong when people don't understand. So I'm just going to give you some very straightforward stats. These, these are numbers from the Australian government from a few years ago. Uh, the risk of Down syndrome. We're familiar with Down syndrome, I assume. So here's a table. I've shown this to undergrad students. I've shown this to expert scientists. I've shown it to people all over the place. I put this up and say, OK, what's the most risky category? You don't have to answer out loud if you're worried. <laughs> you want to get it wrong. Almost invariably, people will say that, and fair enough. By birth, per birth, the most risky category is children born to women who are 45 years and older because the ratio is low. Then I say to them, what if I tell you maybe it's this category? People look a little confused, and I say, well, it depends on your point of view. So if you're trying to come together and think about public policies to support children and parents of children who are born with Down syndrome, far more children are born to women in that age group than in the top age group. So the risk category, in fact, could be quite different, depending on your point of view. Once again, context matters. So this brings me to the notion of facts speaking for themselves. I hear this a lot, and quite coincidentally, uh, my, my friend Bruce here, my new friend, I should say, maybe not after this, mentioned <laughs> this too, the facts speak for themselves. And, and I agree, they do. Facts do speak for themselves. But they have this unfortunate habit of saying different things to different people in different contexts. So what we find then is their effects can also be quite different as well. So the, the facts will speak to me in one way and they'll speak to you in another. And if we don't have an explicit conversation, we don't know what's going on. So turning, I think, in the context of, like we could say novel foods and foods in general, but more generally, risk perception and communication. Now, I don't know, I'm assuming for many of you this is a familiar formula. Technically, risk looks like this. This is the basic articulation of how risk hangs together. It's probability <coughs> times consequence. How likely is the hazard or the terrible thing times the consequence of that happening? 
The formula can be very complicated on the right hand side, but the gist of it is that. This, of course, can be influenced by many other factors. And I'm just going to mention a couple because there are heaps. But just for those of you who are unfamiliar, the perception of that risk may vary quite wildly depending on many things. From the point of view of the person um, concerned, for example, how rare is that event likely to be? How rare does it seem to be? Will affect how deeply concerned people may be about that risk. How much control do we believe we have over the hazard that we're talking about? And the classic is, you know, we all feel safer when we're driving than when someone else is driving. In Australia, I think 98% of people think they're better than average drivers, which is statistically impossible, but we're all convinced. And this is quite similar. We often believe if we have more control, then we're safer, which is probably untrue in many situations. Um, how bad do we think the outcomes will be? So whether it happens or not might not be the issue, but if it did, how horrible would it be? And another one is the extent to which we chose the risk voluntarily. There are many more, as I said. This is just a flavour. So what we see much cleverer in older people than me say is risk, socially speaking, looks more like this. So it's the perception of the hazard, the bad thing, plus the outrage people would experience should it occur. And this can be extremely personal. Outrage doesn't just mean anger. It could mean fear. It could mean despondency. It could mean anything. It could mean lashing out in anger. But this, this is uh, by a guy called Peter Sandman, who's like a, the Pope of risk research and communication. I'm sure he wouldn't like to be called that. I'm not sure. My favourite, though, came around about eight or nine years ago. I'm not responsible for this, but I think this is much more appropriate for the current generation. <laughs> so when you doubt, think of risk that way, and you're probably going to be okay. You're going to get somewhere further. Uh, continuing with risk, just making, oh, we have time. Continuing with risk, this is another one I hear a lot. What's the real risk? Or turn that around, how safe is it? And there's a long conversation about risk versus safety and what that means. We, we're not going to get into that. Two of the things I hear a lot, and I think it's quite reasonable from an expert point of view, why won't people just listen to us? We know what's really going on. Technically, probably true. It's a very reasonable request to have, and it's a very reasonable frustration, but it's not necessarily practical. The reality of the scenario of the communication might not work that way. From the other end of it, if only they, the experts, would tell us the real risk. Or translation, I just want to know if I can eat bacon for breakfast every day. Is that safe? Is that okay for me? And again, this is a very reasonable thing to ask. Of course we want to know if we're safe or not, and of course we want the experts to tell us, but we all know, particularly in this room, it's almost never that straightforward. There are many complexities, there are cultural issues, and so forth. So this kind of leads to two of the most common errors I've seen or come across in risk comms. One is trying to convince people to accept a risk where they get zero benefit, or sometimes even less. So saying to someone, your drinking water isn't safe. You've been drinking it for 100 years. I realise that. You've had no problems with it. We just want to add a little bit of chlorine to it. That's going to make it even safer. And from their perspective, it's already safe. And what you're asking them to do is suddenly accept the fact there's going to be chlorine in their drinking water. Technically, great idea, as I understood last night. But in practice, what you're saying to them is, I want you to take a risk you didn't have yesterday for no benefit, and in fact, potentially worse than no benefit. The other one I see people do is focus, of course, on technical arguments to persuade people to accept that risk. So someone who's not happy about hearing there's going to be chemicals in my water Showing them an equation of how safe or not, not unsafe the chemical is, not helpful. <coughs> Context matters. You will get sick of it. I'll do my best to make you sick of it. Linked to this thing is this notion of telling people what's important to them. But we don't get to do that. We want to, particularly from our, excuse me, particularly from our position of expertise, we, we want to tell people what's important to them, but it just doesn't work. And I had a great example from years ago working... Um, on a, a quick presentation to quarantine people in Australia. And I was talking about risk and I said, so tell me about, tell me about your problems, you know, what are one of your issues? So we have a great one here, that, great one, very big inverted commas. People like to smuggle birds, reptile eggs, etc., in and out of the country, and that's bad. And people would do it like this. And I said, so what do you do? And I said, well, we tell them don't do this. Strap birds to your legs, put eggs in carved out books, get on international flights and take them away or bring them in. I said, cool, why do you tell them not to do that? I said, well, because you should care about biodiversity in Australia, you should care about our economy, you should just be proud to be an Australian and you don't want to hurt all that. And I, I, I confess I tried to keep my poker face, but it wasn't easy because I thought, you're kidding. People who are prepared to strap live parrots to their legs and get on a plane 
do not give a rat about our economy, our national anthem, and even our rugby team, but we'll get to that. <laughs> team, morning team. So you can't tell people what's important to them. It doesn't matter. You can try, but it's unlikely to work. But what you can do is ask them. So that's why, of course, a pitch for academia, we do the research. We find out from people what's important to them. Now, here's one of my favourite phrases when it comes to trying to convince people of things and also seeing how people perceive things. Read it twice because you'll think it's wrong to begin with. I'll see it when I believe it. That's not mine originally, but I, just, I, I love it because it's, it's so wildly true. It's entertaining. And there's a great little study. There are many, but one of my favourites, apologies for the jargon, motivated numeracy. This idea that your values and your beliefs will literally affect the way you interpret simple numbers. So there's a study done in the US by a mob who look at uh, cultural cognition, they call it, if you're interested. Dan Kahan and, and a mob over at Yale. They took a bunch of people who were either very strongly in favour of gun control laws or very strongly against gun control laws. And they were shown some very basic numbers. And they were told either that this was um, talking about how effective a gun control measure will be or how effective a new skin cream will be. Same numbers, same simple relationships between the numbers. And what they found was people who are pro, or who are anti-gun control, when shown numbers that showed the gun control would have a positive effect, didn't read it that way at all. They, they said, no, this is terrible, this is, this, these numbers prove that this doesn't work. When the same kinds of people were shown the same thing about skin cream, that showed the skin cream was effective, no problem, this is a good skin cream. So they were literally, in a sense, rendered innumerate by the power of their values. And the summary, I'll let you read that yourselves, that's one of the summaries from the researchers. So the way we literally interpret basic numbers can be utterly, I hesitate to use the word, but honestly, perverted by the beliefs that we bring to the table. I'll, I'll see it when I believe it. This leads on to talking to audiences, thinking about publics, lay people, whatever you want to say. We're, we're all these people, scientists who are lay just as much as lay people are scientists and so forth. And the three kind of messages I'd offer here is audiences tend to be more diverse than we expect. So we frequently talk about how do we help the public, how do we help them. And we know that people aren't a homogenous mass. Nonetheless, we tend to treat it that way because it's simpler. It makes sense. Um, the differences amongst different interest groups varies wildly and can be a lot more nuanced than you might imagine. And he says overgeneralizing. Overgeneralizing doesn't work well. So be aware of that. To offer a tip or two. So when you're thinking about your audiences, these are the three things I'd suggest anyway. There may be others. There may be some that work better for you. But what does your audience actually want from you? How do you know that? That one might be, maybe should be underlined, bold-faced and capitalized. You'll make assertions about what you think the audience wants, but how do you know that? Quiz yourself directly. Do you actually know that to be true? And finally, what do you want from them? And this is something I think we often forget. We won't say it out loud, or at least we won't be honest about it. So I think you need to be quite explicit about what you want from your audience. So don't say you want them to know climate science if what you want them to do is stop destroying climate. Those are not the same things. So be honest, open, and explicit, and clear in your goals. Speaking of goals, let's link it to assumptions. We all make them, that's what we do. There are many clever and pithy quotes about assumptions being the mother of all stuff ups, etc., etc. I won't make any of those. I just want to talk briefly about them. And this is one from science communication that comes up a lot. Just because you have science facts informing the messages you want to get across, it doesn't mean you need to put them in the message. Now, this might not be as big a deal for you people in this room, but in a, in a realm of science communicators, who tend to be, academically in particular, extremely pro-science. They love science. They love it with a religious zeal. And so they want everyone to love it as much as they do, which is wonderful. But that doesn't mean it's going to be successful and useful. So the idea that you need to have science in the message is, is often a flawed one, unless your job is to convey the science. Then, of course, have that. Fill your messages with science as much as you will. Another assumption, this is often based, uh, often present and prevalent in risk, are you offering people a solution to a problem they don't believe they have? That should become apparent pretty quickly. So, are you think about that. Are you saying, I'm here to solve your drinking water problems, and they're saying, we don't have a drinking water problem. Well, that doesn't matter, I can still fix it for you. Let me tell you technically why it's a problem. How do you find your assumptions? 
This is the advice I'd offer anyone. Whenever you say things like this, what people need to know, the important thing is, we should make sure everyone does. As soon as you make these assertions, you're making assumptions. They may not be articulated. But as soon as you hear yourself, your team, your people, your students, your, your lecturers, whatever it may be, saying this, that's an assumption flag. So stop and think, well, why? Why must people know this? Why should we all do that? Again, how do you know? Go back to that. Think about it in context, etc., etc. Winding up now. I know it's a whirlwind. I'm bombarding you at high speed with great enthusiasm. It's because I like this stuff. I find it really interesting. It's hard to know how much to trim down. Rights and wrongs. A little bit on the idea of what's okay. So I'm going to talk about persuasion briefly. Persuasion seems to be okay. We accept it in, adver in advertisements, marketing and ads. We accept it one way or another in politicians. Is it okay for science and scientists to actively try and persuade people? I'll stop popping. A lot of people think not. They feel uncomfortable with that because persuasion comes laden with negative implication that you're trying to manipulate people in ways they don't want to be manipulated or make them do things they don't want to do, etc. But I would say that depends on your goals. So you can use all these things for good and evil and sometimes in between. That's up to you. I'm not here to judge. I'm just here to comment. It's quite different. When I have uh, made these suggestions, uh, in 2014 I wrote a piece in The Conversation. If you don't know The Conversation, I highly recommend it. It's a very interesting source of expert, that uncomfortable term again, advice, but made for a slightly more public and digestible audience. And I wrote a piece like this saying basically we keep on trying to be, for want of a better way of putting it, gentlemanly about the way we communicate our science and our knowledge when it comes to climate. And then the deniers, characterising this crassly, will come back and use every technique of manipulation in the book against that. And they often win, or they at least they flood out the airwaves with those messages that are anti-science, whatever it may be. So I was saying, well, if you really, if your actual goal is to beat these people, again, crass and brutal language, maybe you need to use some of their tactics. So climate deniers went crazy at me. I don't know if you know Christopher Monckton, the goggle-eyed maniac from the UK, who's very really anti-climate. He personally attacked me, which is, I wish I had a badge for that, because I would wear that every day. I got attacked by a bunch of groups in America for saying such outrageous things. I was accused of being a Nazi and wanting to invade Poland. It's fantastic. So that, for my money, that worked. And I was attacked by climate scientists for daring to suggest they cheapen themselves, sully themselves and not offer every caveat about what's going to happen with all the data they have, but why won't people act on climate? And I'm looking at them, I find this a little bit confusing, let's just say. So I suggested one thing. There are many persuasive techniques. That's a whole other lecture course career. But here's one of my faves. I don't know if you remember our former buffoon head, <laughs> headmaster, prime minister. <laughs> he got voted up quite often by saying stuff like this. He just repeated these questions. And not long after he got voted in, he was asked, oh, you become the office of the Minister for Women, which is, there are so many ironies in that, we don't have time for those either. But he said, so what have you done for women in your, or what are you planning on doing for women in your role as this person? And he said that. I asked the, climate, uh, the carbon tax, I stopped the boats and I'm repaying the debt. So he immediately just ignored the question and repeated these slogans. And people who love him repeat the slogans. People who hate him repeat the slogans. People like me are obviously completely bipartisan and ambivalent. <laughs> repeat the slogans. It works. It works, or at least it worked for a while. Now he doesn't have a job anymore and that's fine. So what I'm suggesting, for example, with climate, excuse me, is something like this. A leader we all find a lot more sympathetic, like the most popular country leader in the world at the moment. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. It won't last, but congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> My suggestion is to do something like this. Say that. Whenever you're asked the question, if it's climate, I'm using climate because I know that better, just say that. Say these three messages, whatever they may be, and repeat them. And if you're asked, what about this study that came out on Monday where there was a 5% doubt that one of these things may go wrong? We're breaking the climate. There is no doubt, let's fix it. Just repeat it. Use that tactic. People will get mad with you, but that will get out, and it will get out, and it will get out, and it will get out. It will also get out. It will be repeated by people who hate you, by people who love you. So that's a recommendation. You've got to be comfy with that, though. That said, look, there are no silver bullets to this kind of risk communication stuff. There's no magical formula. One size doesn't fit all. We can't all suddenly give you this one solution to things. And I would hazard then that what the right thing to do is depends on what you want to achieve and the trade-offs, therefore, that you're prepared to make to achieve it. 
and it may be sullying yourself in a climate argument, talking in political slogans, maybe a trade-off you're not prepared to make. I am. If you're a climate person and want to do it, I'll do it for you. I have no beef with that. I don't want to talk the nuances anymore. I'm concerned. So I'll close on just a reminder. Goals, context. If nothing else, can you take those two away if you didn't already know them and you probably did? I think there's a thank you slide inserted here. There is. Thanks, folks. I'll stop here. Yeah, and I, look, I'm sorry I don't mean to ask a specific question or we'll jump straight into a specific question. But, say, your example with the chlorine and water. So, if presenting the science doesn't work, if that's not the right way, what, what, <laughs> what, what would be a way to sell that message? I mean, what, what, what is the, what's, what's, a, what's a more effective way likely to be? Are you ready for an academic's answer? <laughs> that depends. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it really does. I, I don't know the specifics of people. I, I mean, I brought that up because I was having dinner with Paul and some um, colleagues last night, and this, the water issue came up, so that sprang to mind. But, I mean, yeah, it really depends. It depends on what you know about the people's objections to begin with. Like, what are they actually objecting to? And often we find people in a, in a risk scenario will say they're objecting to the chlorine, but they may be objecting to, example, the fact that it's just being put in there without consultation. So it may be the fact that they're being told without their consent, without volunteering to, uh, to consume it, they must, for example. So it may be nothing to do with the science at all, and that's what I mean. So you kind of need to explore that. I know that's not always realistic. I'm aware. I, I work in a university, and we come up with wonderful ideas that no one will fund all the time. It's <laughs> one of our gifts. It's in the job description. So... I know that might not be realistic, but that is what I'd suggest as best you can. Find out actually what the objections may be. I mean, I've seen people interviewed and they say, what? I don't want chemicals in my food. I don't want anything with chemicals in it. And you think, really? So you don't know what a chemical is? Cool. Where do we start with that? Okay, what do you eat? Right? And then maybe you can start a conversation there. What do you think is great? What do you feed your children? I mean, try and find out and dig deeper. Because it probably isn't the chlorine. Probably. But it may be. Thanks very much. See, it depends. You're welcome. <laughs> Can I jump in there too? So, um, so, so Rod made a comment sort of at the beginning. He was deconstructing the topic we gave him about communicating science to the public. And, and what Rod focused on, we made a bit of a joke about this last night, communicating to. It's a little bit like, let's communicate science at the public. There you go, public. You've been communicated at. Maybe we should try communicating with. And then the onus is on us to a certain degree. Understand what's actually going on in their head. Because if communication, almost by definition, is a two-way thing. Hi Rod, um, my name's Matt and I'm from UPI. Um, with any narrative or any kind of story you tell to the public, there's always like two sides, right? There's always a positive story and a negative story. And with like climate change, which you've talked about at length, it seems to be that there's, an, there's always kind of like, you know, there's a bit of tension between the two. There's an opportunity for innovation in climate change. And then there's also that also the tension between like this is an intractable issue you know it's a deep issue that you know it can't be solved and so do you find that the public tend to respond better when the narrative is created at, and tilted towards the positive you know we're moving we're transitioning to a low emissions economy there's exciting opportunities and so do you also find that like you know when you talk about the negative and you enforce it enough people kind of get turned off and then say no I can't do this and I won't do it so there's like a behavioural thing that's kind of going on with the kind of way you communicate these kind of messages to people. I'm just interested in hearing how you, how you found those kind of narratives. Yeah, I think if you can go positive, you should. Again, it depends on the audience. Uh, the, the thing that, along that line, one thing that struck me recently, last week, whenever the climate marches were happening, the climate strikes, whatever they were called, um, there was some interesting stuff in the Australian media interviewing coal miners who were at the marches saying, we have no problem with this, just we know we have transferable skills, show us where to move them. We'll go and weld that instead of that. I don't need to weld the coal mining truck, I'm happy to weld the giant propeller to, to suck in the energy from the wind, no problem at all. But those conversations apparently weren't being had, so that positive message seems to work. Showing the fact that it's not about whether you're with us or against us, I think is important, so that of course catches the public's, the public, I'm generalising one. My, I call my imagination, the fact that a coal miner was there holding up a sign saying, this, and he was talking about, and I spoke to a number of others, they're, they're embarrassed every day to go to work at the moment. They feel terrible, but they need to live, feed families, pay mortgages, go on holiday, you know, we're allowed to go on holiday. All these sorts of things matter. So 
positive messages can work, but not always. I've sat in rooms full of rabid green left folk who have been really angry about positive messages. They just want to try and scare the crap out of everyone. That doesn't work well. It only works for people who want to be frightened or who already agree. So it's horses for courses. Um, so again, I know it's evasive, it's academic, it's like I'm in a tutorial. That depends. What do you think? You know, what, what audience, what people, what issue? Also, what's a big win, a small win? Can you get little incremental steps? The idea that you solve the whole problem in one big, um, one fell swoop, you're doomed to fail. So, I don't know if that helps, but yeah, you kind of got to dig a bit deeper. Like, what are the, the nuances of the actual the, the communication of people involved? And there's probably a lot more than two sides. Hi, I'm Grant Crucible. I'm from Natural Foods. Um, I'm a food manufacturer from Samoa. Um, my question to Bruce is, and uh, what are the qualifiers for safe? Because you put it up there that we're looking for safe food. Um, when we're sending stuff to, or exporting to, say, the United States, uh, we've got to make sure that our food is generally considered safe, but you're saying that the food is exactly safe, because what are the qualifiers for that? Um, I'm, I'm just warning you because it's something that I've hazard to put on any piece of paper that says that my food is exactly 100% safe or anything like that. Because once you do that and it becomes known as unsafe, does that completely discredit your whole 5% um, uh, is what I used to call it, 5% uh, rule? 5% of any population or any sort of action can ruin 95% of a reputation for a company, a country, a reputation, or in this case, New Zealand food stand. Right, it's quite, quite a lot in there, but um, yes. <laughs> so you know, as a New Zealand government, we try to avoid actually saying or giving an assurance that something is safe. Okay, we tend to operate on systems and say it's gone through this, and if it's gone through that, then it should be safe. But we are dealing with biological systems and something happens, these are the expletives you can put in front of that, but things do happen and, and incidents happen. And in, in that, those situations, how you deal with that is almost as important as whether you had the problem or not in the first place. So there are a number of steps. But um, I don't really think, you know, I can't give a legislative or technical answer of what is safe and what isn't safe. It is safe or not safe, but basically, to a point that it's uh, unlikely to cause any foodborne illness, um, so we steer away from quality or other a a attributes as well, uh, excepting that from time to time something out of the system will produce unsafe food and people are, are going to have illnesses as we, we saw on, on the board. So yeah, we do try and steer away from safe. And as I said, uh, we certainly try and steer away from assuring to foreign governments that it's going to be safe, because if it isn't, we're going to get sued. Um, but also, um, and not we, I'm talking collectively, the uh, people responsible as well. So, um, uh, And also, um, we, we, yeah, we don't want to put up on a pedestal that ours is safer than yours or it's safer than safe. We tend to have that line as gone through a system, it should it's safe, and then marketing or other attributes can take it on from there. Um, sorry. Uh, the other thing that I want to ask is, you said that this is based on international standards. Which mm -hmm. standards are you basing them on? Look, most of our food standards are based on codex food standards, so on uh, New Zealand Food Safety website, there's a, there'll be a link to Codex that will explain um, what those standards are. Um, and we base our system on those standards and we take them into account when we make our other food standards. And in some cases we adopt them as New Zealand standards or alternative to New Zealand standards. So if you want to export us some food, the um, you don't have to meet New Zealand's residue standards if you meet a codex standard, and that's written in, into the law. Um, sorry, because I've tried to export to Japan and we've tried to export to Australia and, and uh, New Zealand, uh, one of the things that I just want to quickly um, ask, this is more a technical question than anything else, it's for your food safety standard, um, how, how many times a year are you going to be reviewing that? 
because for instance in Japan it's, they do it every three months and it's kind of scary as, as you said like for business like ourselves in Samoa it's very hard for us to keep up with that whenever they change the standard every three months you're having to completely review your whole system and then look at it I was just wondering uh, whether New Zealand's going to be doing something similar to that because it's a lot of work <laughs> You but mean reviewing international standards? Safety standards, safety standards well, the, yeah. the ones that we pay the most attention to are the government-to-government uh, -government import ones. So there's two two sets of standards. One is, as I mentioned before, you need to meet whatever the internal standard is, whoever you export to, labelling and all of that. Where we become interested in MPI is if a foreign government asks us to mm -hmm. provide an assurance against certain things. and for the most part, it's not against everything that they want. Yeah. So the only thing we will review generally is is the government to government assurance area. But if we become a, if we come across information or changes to laws and things, then we'll let exporters know. But you're quite right. I I know. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. For someone um, sitting there from Frontera, but I know there's a big team of people in Frontera in Beijing and Shanghai that all they do is keep up to date with the internal food laws in, in um, uh, China or in the provinces if they're different. And that's all they do from a commercial point of view so they can meet them. But we, we don't touch that as an agency at all. That is a, a commercial a commercial activity. We're sort of interested, but we would need to be several hundred people if we did that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, just um, something that uh, Rod brought up earlier as well uh, about the, because uh, Samoa and myself, uh, our food changed early 1950s and 1960s, 1970s, and my grandfather, for instance, uh, was physically fit, like uh, what you'd call, like look at CrossFit people, and you'd be like, he was like that all the way up to he was about 60, 70, and then he started smoking you know, 20 packs a, a day, just because he thought, well, you know, I'm cool, I want to be like James Dean, so he'll be smoking constantly throughout the day. The lifestyle changes that we had, like for instance, the introduction of Spam as a traditional food, was only because of the fact that Spam could last a long time. You could sit it on your shelf and you won't have to worry about it. So you could eat it any day, you could eat it on Monday, then eat it on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You buy it at the beginning of the month, and then not have to worry about eating food or buying food or collecting food. Especially when you walk outside, it's 85 degree, 85 percent humidity, 35 degrees. You don't really want to be walking out into a jungle going, oh, let's collect some food when you've got spam right there. So yeah, and I would love for Samoa to put introduce taxes on meat coming into the country, but that's not something that's going to happen. So. Absolutely right. I mean, I'm not telling you, of course you're right. You know, I just, it, it really amazes me to watch how different perspectives can be because we don't have background information. You know? And that, absolutely, of course, it was introduced recently. Yeah. There are good reasons to embrace it, very many good reasons. The nutritionist, however, <laughs> nearly fell backwards in the chair, apparently, she was so shocked at the idea of it. And that just shows how little we can understand or know about people we're talking at slash with. A little bit to, to one side is um, I've been to Samara a couple of times for, for meetings and, and to get family members, aunties that are Samoan and, and um, uh, the, the issue is in the broader food safety is what are the ethics in trade. So yes, we may send fatty lamb uh, flaps to, to Pacific Islands and, and let's say poorer grade food, it's not unsafe, no, it's, not. it's probably unhealthy. So ethics and food trade is probably for another day, but uh, there's certainly yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> quite a bit of that too. <laughs> so, so Rob talked about um, context being important several times. I just that's context to him. It's going to be part of your trademark now, Rob. Um, it, we've done a bit of testing about our, our draft food safety strategy, and and what we found is that consumers are really invested in safety. They they get that it's important. It matters to them, um, and they believe our system produces safe food. And we thought that's great, we're on the same page. But we started digging a little bit deeper and we found what they mean by safety, what we mean by safety is not quite the same thing. So, so we've got a very technical view. It's this probability of times this illness and you can kind of come up with a number. 
But when we talk to the, the public, what we hear is, yes, we're, safety's important, what it means for the environment, what it means for animals, what it means for sustainability, what it means for this, what it means for that, including nutrition, etc. And that's a much broader definition of safety than we've got. It's, it's, um, we would consider it wrong, but actually, if that's our audience, we need to think what the audience is, what the context is. So that's a, that's a statement. The question I'm going to ask you, Bruce, in the context of your discussions with overseas authorities, what does safety mean for them? Because we can have an argument saying it's level of illness, and that's fine, they will agree with the science, and then, as you said, they ask for a bit more. So what's driving the bit more, and what does that mean? Good question, Paul. Thank you. Uh, it actually means different things to different uh, parties. Okay, so we are dealing with government to government. So the safety in, in their mind is their food laws and their food requirements. So at the upper end, of course, they don't want anyone sick or die. But um, most of those governments' uh, import requirements are nothing to do with trade, but they're reflective of their own domestic requirements, which are then driven by the consumers in, in those areas. So um, there are places where they've had foodborne um, incidents, i.e. Like, like China with infant formula, um, then safety is, is, is ob obviously very important, and by default then becomes a import requirement from New Zealand, whether, whether or not they believe we actually have safe infant formula. There's another step to go to provide that assurance. In, in the US, exactly the same. Um, STX and, and E. coli in particular, very important to them. Jack in the box deaths and things like that. So their import requirements and what they require for meat, uh, which is um, driven out of a domestic problem, is our problem from a trading uh, party come, uh, point of view. EU, you can just see that reflected all over the place. So a lot of what's happening domestically, uh, rightly or wrongly, will dr drive our access issues. And, and not all of it around safety either. So I think the more and more um, uh, people become aware of a lot of other factors of their food, as we're talking about, uh, either ethical or um, animal welfare or whatever, uh, probably a climate footprint shortly, or how much carbon went into it, they will become trade issues as well. Um, for Bruce, so I find your view quite interesting in that, obviously, it's a frustration for you that other countries have restrictive uh, import requirements that New Zealand needs to, or are inflexible for no other reason than they're inflexible, but how do you reconcile that view? with the import health standard systems, even though they're currently under review, where there are inflexibilities in the system. For example, let's take pork. The import health standard for pork... <laughs> I see you've gone straight for the joke. Oh, yeah. I am. Uh, has has a, a, a 3 kg pack requirement. And there's and at the border, uh, often those products are stuck. Um, an entire shipment will be stuck with one pack is 4 grams over the 3 kg. So are you committed to ensuring that those inflexibilities are removed in the review of the import health standards? <laughs> I'm USDA, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great question. I, I see the, um, um, the uh, swine fever's reached East Timor today, so we're probably going to end up with even more pressure from domestic... Australia, New Zealand, around that. But that's a biosecurity issue. I put biosecurity accepted in brackets up there. But, uh, <coughs> but, but yes, in, in, that, um, in that context, um, the, the import health standards are around biosecurity controls, not food safety. Although we do hide behind them a bit because we are kind of known for quite tough biosecurity uh, controls, so therefore they never reach a food safety problem because the either animal or plant health will stop it in, in the middle. So um, I, I think all, all I can say is there's two parts. There's reviews of the import health standards as they sit at the moment, but there's also a review of the entire biosecurity act and framework that they sit under. And, and all I can say is the, the outcome of that is to improve the transparency of the process and to ensure that um, that we do d deliver 
um, and just talking about outcomes for the review here, not promising anything for the court, um, is... I won't um, report it, I promise. No, 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 no. Uh, is um, that we do have consistent like-for-like -like outcomes and our level of, appropriate level of protection that comes out of that system. So that, that's into the future to try and address that problem. If you talk about risk communication, that we just heard about before, that's exactly the scenario we have for pork or poultry in New Zealand, which are domestic focused industries. And we as NPI or importers are asking those industries to take a risk, no matter how small, to enable you and I in New Zealand to have cheaper pork or poultry or those products. And, and um, and they sit there thinking, well, why should we take any risk? We're not going to benefit from that whatsoever. So as decision makers in MPI and the government has to balance those up and we're just not going to satisfy all the parties. So it's a, as you all know, it's a pretty hard, uh, hard task. Yeah, well, good on you. That was a decent answer, I have to say. <laughs> and, uh, and Rob, for you, uh, uh, as far as science communication goes, I, I feel like... Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, you're on the verge of actually changing it from science communication to the discipline of science marketing and consumer engagement. How do you feel about that? And has that conversation been had? had sorry. <clears throat> How do I feel about it? I'm happy to make it a sub branch. <laughs> um, it doesn't scare me as much as others. No, I don't think, the, from the perspective that I have, academic and related, I, I don't consider as science marketers. I spend a lot of my time picking on science and scientists more than anything else because I am concerned about that, just the sort of flag-waving rah 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 of it all, I think that's a problem. And it leads us to bad conversations or no conversations. So uh, there are places and times when marketing is definitely necessary and I think scientists should embrace it. Um, and I try to encourage them and it's varying degrees of success. But there are other times where no, I'm quite anti because it's, it's just awkward and embarrassing, honestly. There's no more scholarly way of putting it. It's just like, stop it. People don't want to hear that. Well, certain people aren't interested. You love it is great. Doesn't mean other people love it. Why can't you accept that? It's like when people tell me at home I should like Australian rules football, and I say I don't because it means people go and play AFL instead of rugby, and we can't beat you guys. <laughs> I just have, you know they have to accept that in me. I'm not a fan of our own sport. You know? So I mean th this is what I think. So marketing important, not always horses for courses. Context was that evasive enough? Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, kia ora, my name is Michelle. I work for Wellington City Council. Um, this is a question for Dr. Lambert. Um, so you had an interesting slide up there saying you don't get to tell people what's important to them. Um, I work in food safety as a verifier, and so that tends to be what I do all day. Um, I'm long. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I was just sort of curious because in some ways I like asking what is important to an operator in terms of what they do, what processes they have in place and I strongly believe that most of the customers that we have want to do the right thing and meet food safety standards but there's also regulations in place that aren't going to go away so in order for them to, to meet those regulations and to be successful do you think it's a matter of just being constantly persuasive? Yeah, possibly, and if the reality is if they want to operate in a space and those rules are the rules, feelings don't matter a lot. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, this is, this is another kind of implicit myth that I hear is that people don't say it, but what they're really asking me is how do we make this all go beautifully, smoothly, and everyone will be happy? And I smile politely and say, I don't think you can. Well, then how do we make people do what we want, uh, what we want them to do because we know it's right? I say guns or money. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's not popular either. So, I mean, in the end, not everyone's going to be happy. Um, but you can talk about trade-offs with them and say, well, the reality of this situation is X. If you don't like it, here are mechanisms for changing it. But some people aren't going to like it. Uh, um, you know, we're all grown-ups. We have to make decisions and we have to sometimes just bite down and, and, and bear it, you know. So I, I don't want to paint this rosy view of perfection here because I don't think it exists. I've not seen evidence of it yet. Um, don't be afraid of the fact that some people will be pissed off because they will. You know, that's Okay. In fact, it doesn't matter. It's inevitable. You know, someone's going to be mad with you. So that's cool. <laughs> no, honestly, though, I think this is the mistake that we're, they're going to come up with this magic bullet that will solve the problems of people accepting things, being happy with regulations, being happy with restrictions, and some people won't be. I think that's human condition stuff. Let's generalise wildly, but I think it is. So that's all right. 
get a good therapist? I don't know. <laughs> Help deal with yourself, maybe. <laughs> Not suggesting you need therapy, just in case. <laughs> Rob talked about rugby before, so 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 we had dinner last night with with a, another couple. That's not quite how I meant to describe it, but, but you know we got on really well. Um, so so Rob and I we started talking about rugby, as you know a couple of blokes do. It was pretty obvious from the other party's point of view. We knew nothing about rugby, neither of us knew about it. But we talked, and, and it was kind of irrelevant. What we were sort of doing is sort of exploring each other, you know, figuring out what our values were, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it occurred to me that's pretty normal. That's what people do when they first start having a conversation. You kind of try and find out where is this person coming from. The substance doesn't really matter. Um, so I guess my question for you, Rod, is if you, you know you, you had that thing up there, I'll see it when I believe it. Um, and, you, and you then talked about values and assumptions and so on behind it. Would you recommend that if we are trying to go into a conversation that we suspect will be contentious, should we spend time exploring what those values are, etc., including our own, potentially, before we get into the substance? And, and I'm assuming there's a kind of a yes, and my follow-up question would be if so, how? Kind of yes, Paul. <laughs> Uh, again, it's, it's going to depend on the interactions, the power relationships, all those, all those good things. Also, you know, the, the, the cultural mores of the area you're going into. I mean, Australians can be pretty brusque, direct, and don't care about context at times, and other times you need to kind of, you know, wine and dine us before we'll start talking to you honestly. Um, so picking that is important. But yeah, the, the, the main thing I'd say is authenticity. If you go in and obviously are bullshitting, it's going to stand out a mile away. And particularly, I mean, Middle-aged, over-educated, white, male, what is it, cis, normative, blah, I'm, I'm all the things that's terrible and wicked now, and I accept that. I've had a wonderful life, it's all very privileged, etc. So that already puts you behind the eight ball, you seem insincere almost by definition if you're not careful. But if you go in and fake it, oh no, I really care about you people, I think it's great, tell me more, you know, you, you look stupid, and you look terrible, and you alienate. So I think it's this is the authenticity thing that matters. Um, which is why I do swear in public fora because I swear, you know, it's genuinely me and the way I interact with the world. Um, if I start to be all polite and careful, I'd look fake, and that doesn't help. So I, I, I don't, I can't tell you what authenticity is for you, 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 whatever. But I can say that if it feels fake, it probably is, and that's going to that's going to stand out. Cool. Thank you, uh, Bruce. You talked about um, Imfet's statement of intent being around delivering on New Zealand's values. I don't know what New Zealand's values are. I'm pretty sure the Prime Minister doesn't. She talked about them a lot after March 15. Um, but I was just wondering if, if you, being from the government, have any clue as to what New Zealand's values are. Um, <laughs> the second question, Rod, while Bruce is grappling with that one. Um, Rod, why, why are we um, living in a world that is perhaps the safest it's ever been, that we're the most travelled of any at any time in history, yet we're so um, increasingly afraid of everything and so xenophobic about everything. Um, well, how can you reconcile that for me, please? I'll, I'll take your question on notice and <laughs> forward it to Jacinda. Um, but to some extent, and I, I think um, you, you would recognise with your time that you had been with, let's say, MPI or your current agency, that, that you know, sometimes agencies have grappled with values, what they are, and, and as, as a society, it's my understanding that MPI has kind of deleted the values that we used to have and have gone more for our strategic outcomes focus and the way we work is a general acknowledgement of, of, of values. So I, I really can't answer what the New Zealand government or, um, or, or other other values are, sorry. I, I think you can imply them from a whole range of things is what we do within our own environment here. Um, but, uh, um, you know, stated values and things, we have aspirations, we have goals, uh, and we are expected to work ethically. Uh, the word social uh, license to operate comes up quite a bit now with government. Uh, this government's about to, to put my trade hat on, release uh, its trade trade for all policy. There's certain values and, and outcomes in there that would be big drivers for MPI in New Zealand as well. 
That was a smooth answer. I don't know what to do with mine now. <laughs> I, I, think, I can't say our values. I think we're better at pointing at something and saying that does not align with my values rather than articulating what our values are. We're very good at seeing them when they're not. Not as good as identifying. It's like health is the absence of illness, but no, no. Other than the absence of illness, what is health? Go break out into small groups, talk about that for 15 minutes, and you'll come away more confused than when you started. So I think values is a tough one. Um, in terms of what was it? Why are we more frightened even though we're safer than ever? Uh, and stuff like that. Yeah. Uh, good question. Complex question. I, I think there are a number of things going on. I'll tell you one, honestly, one of them is my first and most cynical response is because we have time to be. Particularly in countries like Australia in here, we've got plenty of time to worry about stuff. And I use that as an example of how wealthy we all are. People have time to worry about the tiniest little things and talk about how terrible they are, blow them out of proportion over a few Chardonnays and delicious pork from New Zealand. And, and <laughs> so we can. Uh, and of course, that's not the same all over the world. Um, the, but in terms of that, we have more information than ever, we're safer than ever. The, the speed with which information transfers we know is stronger. It is easier to only hear the stuff that resonates with your values if you so choose. So you get these resonance chambers of fear and it's not directly my realm of expertise but I hang around with people like this. We know in times of perceived uncertainty people err to the conservative and they err to their own tribe, whatever their tribe is. And I think we're seeing a lot of that going on where the more we're frightened for real or fake reasons, the more we start to look inward rather than outward. And the facts again have nothing to do with it. Yeah, there's a huge availability of facts, but that's also drinking from a fire hose. So, you know, which which fact do you take? How do you filter through it? I mean, these are really simplistic ads. This is like a five beer long night conversation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's a kick off though. Sorry, gentleman in the back. I was just going to carry on the conversation to say that, um, yeah, the, it's, it's also the fact that we're, I'm including myself in this because I'm also a New Zealand citizen. Um, we can afford to be. We can afford to be. Like, uh, when you don't have any money and you have very, a lot to worry about, for instance, if you've got kids, if you have a house or family that you have to look after that isn't necessarily your own children, other dependents. Most of us here will have time on our hands and money on our hands and the literal uh, like knowledge and understanding to afford to be able to worry about all these things. Because... We never got pointed out to us before that we were doing something wrong. Now, every day, we're starting to understand that, hey, maybe what we're doing may not be the best course of action, may not be <clears throat> the right thing to do. And so we have to look at that, make an assessment, and make the judgment whether we should be affording to ruin our own world or ruin our own country, or, in my case, work in another country and <laughs> try and do the best that I can with what we've got. And it, it is something that we are allowed and can afford to do, worry about our future. And I can can I add, I'll tell you a story that I heard from people who were in um, uh, Cape Town not that long ago, I think it was Cape Town, South Africa, talking about how there were young mothers deliberately uh, getting infected with HIV. Mm. And the reason was the government at the time, I don't know if it's still going on, would offer food vouchers to people who had HIV and couldn't work or had children, etc. And this is eyebrow raising for people in these safe towns like yours and mine and so forth. But, you know, the, the short term priority was uh, I don't want my kids to starve. I'll handle the HIV thing later because I can eat. And, and, you know, when I don't think I'm looking around the room, none of you look like you're in that position. I know I'm not. So, yeah, reinforcing like we, we have time. We have the time and the luxury to, to worry about a lot of stuff. Lucky us. <laughs> Thank you. Gail. Oh, sorry, sorry, Bruce. That, that's something we do need to be conscious of, and we do hear it back from our trading partners and things. And, and um, we, we might talk about labelling or fat content or no sugars and things. And, and I was doing that once, and then I felt a little bit small and arrogant in a sense when the, um, actually it was a, a, a minister come back to me and say, well, actually, I've got 50 million people where I'm worried about where the next meal's coming from. So you have to put things into context. Um, Rod, when you brought up the um, little clips about the small messages, and um, I was thinking along the lines that we have um, valuable scientific messages that might be complex and need to be put into context, and yet we've got Twitter and other things being used rapidly to pass um, messages which could be very polarising for people. 
So how can we use that new um, public media, and this is for our MPI messages and changes, our New, new Zealand food safety messages, how would you recommend that we um, can utilise it to both help convey messages that are worthwhile conveying and to receive feedback and to uh, deliver um, our, our, another means of delivering our messages, which we certainly don't use in our long documents on our um, MPI website, if you've looked at it recently. <laughs> so, 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 Robin Bruce, you've got 30 seconds each. <laughs> okay, if you're a government department you want to get involved in Twitter and things like that, for starters you need to remove pretty much every barrier and everything that time restricts people's ability to respond. That will never happen as far as I understand it, but honestly these media do not wait for 45 minutes for someone to decide. So if you can't respond quickly to a medium like Twitter, I don't know, get off Twitter or only make announcements. Um, the only other thing I'll ask slash say is Again, back to goals, if, if your message is to convey the science, that's fine, but make sure that is what you're trying to do. It could just be the message is, I want you to know there's a bunch of really deep and intense science going on in places in our area. If you want to know more, go here. That's it. Appeal to the people who might want to know that. And just to be honest, this is about telling about some science we've done, not we want you to change your behaviour in X, Y and Z ways. This document that has been done in the chemistry lab tells you why, because it doesn't. It's a different thing, so message clarity really break it down in simples. But if you've got to wait an hour and a half to respond to a tweet, it's gone. So just change the government policies. We have that in Australia too. We need a social media strategy and say, cool, start by removing the restrictions, short meeting. And, and therein lies a double-edged sword for a, a government department. So yes, the, the social media, we've had our foreign governments telling us about food recalls that we didn't know about in Wellington but asking us, did you export to anywhere? So yes, we have to be responsive, but we, we actually have to be responsible in those responses as well. So not get onto a bandwagon and BS or, 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 uh, or because you'll lose your credibility straight away. Um, so um, if, if, you have the, if we have the material and uh, pre-prepared or whatever, then away you go, otherwise, uh, you just need time and space to get the right, I say the right messages. You, 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 you just can't. Um, it's more about engagement. Yeah. So, um, and, and, and I think worldwide it's become going to become an even greater problem because the um, uh, this, the the social media is always going to be ahead of of slow bureaucracies and getting messages out. Can I tell a great success story? Sure. Oh, can we give that? Yeah, yeah, okay, Rob. Right. Yeah, put yourself out. A buddy of mine's a, a science writer, communication storytelling science dude in the States, and he was talking about the, the Centers for Disease Control. There was a situation where they wanted to get people to get uh, uh, outbreak and plague, etc., preparedness kits, and convince people of how important it was. They needed, you know, water and a hand wound torch, etc. And a couple of people went rogue in the CDC and said, you know what, this is exactly like what you'd need if a zombie outbreak happened. And that's how they promoted it. It crashed the servers within hours. It got made to Fox News. They got so many hits, so much cut through. Um, did they lose credibility? Maybe, but a lot of other people took them a lot more seriously or interested in hearing from them again. I'm not recommending it. I'm saying <laughs> it's remarkable what the effect can be. Suddenly people had preparedness kits because they put it in zombie language. So you may be surprised. It's risky. But, you know, who needs a job? <laughs> Thank you, Rock. We, we will take that one uh, under consideration. Hey, look, I will, I will draw a close under it now. Thank you very much for your participation. They've been great questions. Um, it's, it's certainly, uh, yeah, actually, thank you, guys. Appreciate it.